I'm Neil Reardon, and um, I'm in, in the stem cell world. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a scientist, I'm an inventor, and I'm also an entrepreneur. And um, I started working with stem cells as a cancer researcher, and um, we were making therapeutic cancer vaccines, and the starting material for those cancer vaccines were stem cells. So my first patent in this world was, a, was on a, a method for taking X number of stem cells and making a thousand X stem cells. So it was a method of growing stem cells in the, in the, uh, in the laboratory. Um, my first interest in the MSC, there are two major types of stem cells. There's the HSC, which basically makes all of your blood products, and the MSC, which is found in every tissue in your body. And the MSC is um, what I've been focused on now for more than 15 years. Um, there's a, a, the, the first drug ever approved in a tier one country is an MSC product made from bone marrow, and it's approved in Canada and New Zealand and Japan. And so uh, <clears throat> the founder of that company is actually a mentor of mine, Dr. Arnold Kaplan at Case Western Reserve, and he actually named the mesenchymal stem cell. That's how far he goes back. My relationship with him and um, and others in the field um, led me towards more and more research using MSCs rather than HSCs. And uh, I, I haven't had anything to do in, with cancer vaccines for some period of time, and uh, most of my effort has been on regenerative use of um, MSCs predominantly from live healthy births where the baby is born and the umbilical cord's clamped and it's cut and the baby's taken away and uh, then the mom delivers the afterbirth, which is the placenta, the amnion, and the, um, what's left of the umbilical cord. And that's what goes into our laboratory. Um, and that's our source for, for the stem cells that we use. What point did you start using stem cells to treat various ailments? In earnest, probably in 2004, was when we started uh, using uh, MSCs for regenerative purposes. Um, the reason that we are in Panama is because in 2004, Panama passed a law. They did not want people uh, using embryonic stem cells. And um, so the law, one half of the law prohibits the use of embryonic stem cells. The other half of the law enabled the use of adult stem cells, including stem cells from umbilical cords, where nobody's harmed in the process, no future human or you know, has, has been uh, harmed in any way, and uh, that allowed, for, allowed doctors to treat patients using those stem cells. So that was my attraction to Panama when I found out about that law, because I thought there were a lot of uses for um, MSCs from afterbirth, and so that's what took me to Panama. So in, in earnest, basically, it's since that 2004 law that was passed in Panama. Wow. And so in Panama, we now have uh, 60, 65 employees. Um, we have three companies. Uh, one is a, is a laboratory that's fully licensed by the Panamanian uh, Ministry of Health for basically making clinical use uh, stem cells from afterbirth. Um, and uh, another company is a clinical trials company. We're doing seven clinical trials there. We've completed two. We have five more that are ongoing. The two that we've completed are in autism and in multiple sclerosis. So, and then we have um, a, a medical clinic there as well. So we've treated thousands of patients. We've, get, we've administered over 30,000 doses of cells or treatment cycles to people because a lot of, a lot of people are repeat, you know, they come down multiply. So it's, uh, we've been there fully operational for 10 years. It took us a few years to build our laboratory, which is quite extensive. The laboratory is at the City of Knowledge, which is the former U.S. Southern Command and Control uh, for the U.S. Army, which across the, uh, basically across the street from the Panama Canal. So that's where our um, clinical trials company is and where our laboratory is, and then our, our, our medical clinic is basically in a high-rise downtown. You know, you mentioned two clinical trials um, have been completed, mm -hmm. one in autism, one in MS. Mm -hmm. Tell me about the autism one. Well, uh, until it's published, I really can't tell okay. you the results. I can tell you there were, uh, I can tell you the, um, 
uh, we're excited about the results and we're excited to get them published. And I, uh, I, I can tell you that in general, in the, in the tens of thousands of, of, of administrations that we've given, there have been no serious adverse events. Um, none. And, and that, none. And that includes, the, that includes all the clinical trials we're doing. We've yet to see a serious adverse event. Um, just to talk a little bit about the safety of these cells, um, in contrast to embryonic stem cells, embryonic stem cells want to become a baby. These cells don't. These cells are there basically to keep everything on the straight and narrow, right? Keep you healthy. That's what they're there for. They're found in every tissue in your body. They don't form tumors. In fact, they have profound anti-tumor activity. Um, they are, they can, um, they migrate to areas of inflammation and basically secrete what's needed. And in, in people with, uh, with autoimmune diseases, they, um, their, their, their documented deficiencies, either, either there aren't enough of the cells or the cells don't do what they're supposed to do. And so by taking young, healthy cells and giving them to somebody with an autoimmune disease, you can reset the immune system. So for example, in uh, rheumatoid arthritis, um, there's a molecule there that's called TNF-alpha, right? And there are three drugs that are on the market that I know of, probably more now, that they're antibodies to those, that basically a general in the immune system that is making all these, leading the charge on, ma on making all these symptoms. Well, the, there's, a, there's, a, there's a kind of a, a, a cell in, that, that tells the immune system not to do that. And so they're deficient in that cell. Well, when you infuse these, the umbilical MSCs IV, what happens is those, the, the, those, those regulatory cells go up and they tell the immune system to quit making so much TNF-alpha. So the, uh, the root cause of rheumatoid arthritis is a lack of these T regulatory cells. And the way to get the body to make more of them is give umbilical MSCs to the person and they make more and then everything's regulated from there. So, I mean, among the things that you've been treating, what do you, what are you most encouraged when you see? I mean, what have been some of your best results? Well, I'm certainly encouraged by autism. I'm very encouraged by MS. I'm very, very encouraged by rheumatoid arthritis. I'm very encouraged by uh, spinal cord injury. Um, we, we just received a letter of funding from the Marcus Foundation to treat, uh, to do a study. Mar Bernie Marcus, the co-founder of Home Depot, um, funded a study through the University of Miami with uh, the University of Miami and uh, the and Thomas Jefferson University would be the two clinical sites for treating spinal cord injury because Bernie's been down there himself he's actually in my book you know talking about his experiences his family's experiences in Panama and um, and so he's, he asked me one day what, what, what's the one thing you'd really like to get out there in the US and I said well spinal cord injury there's nothing for it and we have cases here of people who have who had complete, uh, complete spinal cord injury, they're able to walk and walk and they get their bowel function back, bladder function, sexual function. And I think uh, it's, it's, it's the most underserved. I mean, it's, it's not as high as numbers as autism, not as high as numbers of, as MS, but there are people that have nothing. And you know, ultimately, there's, for, after six months from spinal cord injury, most neurosurgeons would agree that you're not gonna get anything back. And to see people two years out getting restoration of function, people after six months getting complete restoration of function, I thought um, that would be good. And, and ultimately, the University of Miami got the letter of funding last week, so that's going to go forward. Um, we're very passionate about Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. I talk a lot about um, a, a very close personal friend, um, uh, his son, who's also a close personal friend, uh, Ryan Benton. Uh, who, who at 22 basically was given another couple years to live with Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. And um, we started treating him at that time, and we, we treated him uh, now continuously for nine years. And he's healthier now than he was at 22. And he's, he'll turn, he'll turn well, he's 31, he'll turn 32 in January. Um, and then we have another little boy that we treated since he was three and a half, and now he's six and a half and he is doing fantastically well. I think ultimately with the Shens, what you're gonna find is that the, 
these, these kids are not gonna know they have Duchenne's. They'll go, they'll go into the clinic. Once they're diagnosed, they'll go in the clinic every four months. They'll get, get an IV infusion, maybe one or two, and then that will reset their ability to make the molecule that they're missing. We have two compassionate use INDs. So these, these are the first humans to get treated with umbilical cord MSCs in the United States because we have compassionate use. We had data showing that they're objectively improved after the treatment. The treatment only lasts for four to eight months and then the cells start dis dissipating so they need to be retreated. So it's like a, sort of like a, you know, a diabetic getting insulin on a, on a much, you know, longer time scale. But um, I think Duchenne's is gonna be, it's very exciting. There's, there's really nothing for Duchenne's. There's some only symptomatic. There's nothing that actually improves function on the market available. Um, there's, um, we recently treated Lee syndrome. Uh, it's a mitochondrial disease and saw some fantastic results. We've been treating uh, a, a young lady with spinal muscular atrophy for eight, uh, six years now. And she is, um, it's a childhood form of ALS. It's actually more prevalent than ALS. And I, th I think those pediatric orphan status um, diseases, I, I, find, I, I find to be, I'm, more, I'm most passionate about that when you see, you know, at being the father of four and understanding what a struggle it is when you have a sick kid, particularly when you feel impotent about it. Um, so I think my passion is there uh, more than anything else, but, um, but there's, I, you know, there's, there's a lot of, there are a lot of conditions that can be helped and heart failure is another one. Um, and I'm rattling off these diseases and I can imagine the audience saying, well, how is it that one thing can treat so many things? How is it that one thing can treat so many things? Well, the short answer is that the, the, reason, the, the reason that most of those diseases exist is because they are either a lack of or a dysfunction of the MSC. And so in these, these cells are found in every tissue in your body around every blood vessel. So if you're, imagine in your heart, you have, you have the heart stem cell and next to it is an MSC and they're right next to a blood vessel. So on every blood vessel, in every tissue in your body, you have these little sets, right? And so in heart failure, what happens is the MSCs are worn out. And so they're stimulating the, the tissue stem cell to make more tissue and there's no more stimulation left. So if you can reset them, recharge them, then the tissue stem cells can take over and actually help, help the system out. In the, in the case of autoimmunity, the, the absolute cause of MS of rheumatoid arthritis and lupus are either dysfunctional or lack of MSC. So if the root cause of something is X and you give X, then the likelihood is that you're gonna have a good benefit. And that's why, um, that, that's, that's why these cells are, in my mind, are, are, it's, are beyond, I mean, you basically had, you had vaccines, you have antibiotics, and now you have MSCs. And it's the, I think the, the impact, on, global impact, is gonna be greater than those two combined. Right. Because you have, now you have all, now that, now that we have all these infectious disease mostly sorted out um, through vac vaccination and then through antibiotics, uh, now people are living longer and now what, it, what are the major conditions? Most of them are chronic, are chronic illnesses. So uh, just to backtrack on Duchenne's, the way the cells work there is when they're infused, they, they home to the muscle, which is inflamed, and they secrete the molecules that, uh, uh, because they're genetically normal, then they, they secrete dystrophin, which is the molecule that's missing, right? So you, you take, with Duchenne's, you can have a kid that's producing no dystrophin, and in, in two, three months, they're producing normal levels of dystrophin. Well, that only happens for a period of time, and the cells die off, and then you have to retreat. So, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm certain there's a gene therapy down the road that can, that can fix all that, but right now, this is a very good tool for it. And it's a very good tool also for the other conditions I mentioned. Well, you've mentioned a lot of conditions. How many patients have you treated over these years? Well, it's, it's more than 5,000 total. So successfully treated more than that, 5,000 Well, patients. I wouldn't say everybody's been successfully treated, but I can say that the vast majority of people that come 
get, get some benefit, and it depends on what condition they have, what condition they're in. You know, rheumatoid arthritis is probably the easiest one because the vast majority of them get better after a single treatment because it's, it's relatively simple to reset that, their immune system. With MS, it's a much broader spectrum of disease. You can have a very, very you know, steep decline. You can have people that are, that are relapsing, remitting, and having very gentle symptoms. So uh, it's a lot more dif difficult uh, to quantify exactly what you're doing. But we do, we, our trial that, that, that we have completed, which is in review for publication right now, uh, we'll let the world know exactly what those numbers are uh, as far as uh, use, doing a single treatment with MS. But I think you've interviewed some MS, MS patients and some of them can do quite well for a long period of time with one treatment and others require multiple treatments. It depends on the severity of their disease and, and that sort of thing. Now why aren't more doctors doing this in the United States? Well, number one, uh, they're, they're, it's not legal to do in the U.S. Um, there, are, are there are a number of clinics that are using adipose fat-derived stem cells. Um, I think FDA is clamping down on that. Uh, I, I would never do it. We were the first to ever do it in the world. We've, we've been, we did that from 2006 until 2010. In fact, if you look at the literature, the only published articles, I mean, from that period are from our group. Oh. So we kind of pioneered that. Um, I would never do it in the U.S. because it was unclear from a regulatory standpoint where the FDA stood on it. So we never did it in the U.S. When I when I started my orthopedic clinic, I said we're not doing we're not doing adipose because it's not a uh, I don't believe it's a clear regulatory line, and uh, and and I think now you're going to see a lot of those clinics. The FDA is going to take action against a lot of those clinics using the patient's own fat, which I I don't particularly agree with if it's done in a rational um, responsible way, and I think, you know, jumping to the Texas HB 810, that 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 was written in such a way that it would it would require people to do the appropriate things to actually do clinical work with uh, do clinical trials with adipose stem cells and and other types of stem cells. So uh, there are, you know, at last count, over 500 clinics using you know, various types of stem cells in the U.S., and it's really exploded in the last maybe two or three years. You used adipose stem cells here in Texas, um, and you stopped doing it. Um, can you oh, that's not true. I never used adipose stem oh. cells in the United States at all. We, we did that outside of the country. Mm -hmm. We were the first to do it, but we did it not in the U.S. So um, the, the reason I never felt comfortable doing it in the U.S. is because FDA's position was that if you, and still is, if you manipulate the tissue beyond a certain level, then it's considered a new drug. And um, I never felt comfortable with the regulations, so I never, when we opened our orthopedic clinic, I mean, it was, it was low-hanging fruit, but I didn't want to do it because I didn't want, uh, I didn't want any, any problems with the FDA, so we just stayed out of it. And there, there's been a huge proliferation of clinics doing adipose, and I think some of them are doing it responsible, but most, mo responsibly, but most of them are not. And now I think FDA is, is taking a, a, take what I consider to be a reasonable position of, of uh, taking out at least the bad actors, the ones that are hurting people, and um, I, I think the state medical board should have done it before the FDA. The long and the short of it is, I, I, I'm not willing to do something that's, uh, you know, gray. And you know, in Panama, we're fully licensed by the Ministry of Health to do what we do. Um, and 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 I wouldn't do anything in Texas if we weren't AF, FDA approved, or you know, if this HB 810, if there's a detente on that with the federal gut with the FDA. Then, then and only then would I consider doing something here uh, in, in the, either the adipose space or the umbilical cord space. I will tell you that what we did find is that the umbilical cord cells, because we're able to, we were able to retrospectively analyze the vast number of patients we've treated and, and find out which cells work for what, that we're able to screen for cells that are, have high efficaciousness, or high efficacy, right? So, you, you know, if, you want, if, you, if, you, if you're picking a basketball team, 
um, and there's LeBron James and me, uh, I think LeBron's going to go first, right? So um, what we want are these cells that have those kind of the, the innate capacity to do the things that the cells should do, which are modulate the immune system, decrease the inflammation, and in the case of spinal cord and other things, stimulate regeneration. So we have, given our database, we've been able to discover that and figure out which molecules are found at what levels in the cells that are LeBrons, and the, and the, the non-LeBrons we just throw away. So because of that, um, the, the, the ability for these, the umbilical cord cells, selected umbilical cord cells to benefit people is much higher than, than randomly taking somebody's adipose tissue and using it because um, the cells have been highly selected for. We know exactly how many cells we're giving. We know what the viability is. We know every, it, 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 they're highly characterized. Whereas in a, in a single, you know, in, a, in an office setting you're, you're, where you suck, suck out some fat and digest it and put it into somebody, you really don't know exactly what you put into somebody. So what we did outside of the country is we would do the liposuction and we would wait eight to 10 days before we gave the cells back because number one, we wanted to know what cells we were giving. Number two, we wanted absolute assured, uh, assurance that the, the product was sterile and that's not being done in the United States. So the only way right now that people are operating is they're doing same day. They have no idea of the sterility. They don't, the vast majority of them don't characterize the cells. So they don't even know how many stem cells they're giving, how many white blood cells they're giving, how many EPCs, because it's a gemish of cells, uh, the, the, the same day procedure. So that's, th those are all the reasons why I, I don't want to do same day. I don't want to do fat drive uh, stuff in the US. If I were to do it, I would only do it so I could ensure that the product was sterile going back in the patient and that, that the product was completely characterized and we knew what it was going back into the patient. But as I mentioned before, with the, a lot of these clinics are treating autoimmune diseases by giving these cells intravenously. And there are, you know, there, no doubt there's, there's potential for benefit, but um, the, the, the actual, you know, cells from people, even in the adipose compartment from people with, with an autoimmune disease are dysfunctional. That's why they have the autoimmune disease. So the, the, if you look at the cost of doing a liposuction and you look at the risk of doing a liposuction and you look at the cost of taking cells that have been expanded from one umbilical cord to treat a thousand people, the costs go way down, the risk to the patient goes way down and the, the potential efficacy goes way up because these cells are screened to do what they're supposed to do and you know exactly what you're giving to the to the patient or the subject. Now you have an orthopedic clinic in Texas, yes? Mm -hmm. Do you use any stem cell treatment there? We use bone marrow. Bone marrow is exempt. Um, so there are uh, FDA approved machines to uh, concentrate the bone marrow basically to get rid of the red cells and the, the, the other stuff, right? And get it down just to the, the, the cell layer that has the stem cells in it. So. Yeah, my partner, Dr. McKenna, does the, a lot of procedures and he uses stem cells a lot of the time. Um, you know, for, or, for orthopedic conditions, they stimulate, they're, they're, there's not, they're more, they're the two kinds of stem cells, which are the HSCs and the MSCs. So the HSCs can stimulate new blood vessel growth, which is required for repair of any tissue. And the MSCs can stimulate that also to a smaller degree, but they decrease inflammation and they calm down the, infl the, the immune system and they, they stimulate regeneration. So that's what you want. So instead of taking, for example, um, you know, there's, there are studies showing that you can take bone marrow concentrate, which contains the stem cells, and uh, like when you do a rotator cuff repair, at six months, it's about 30% of the people fail, but if you put stem cells in there, it's 0%. And at 10 years, you have 13% failure rate versus 56% failure rate. So. Uh, it basically augments the natural healing process. Uh, the other big benefit is that the MSCs secrete an antimicrobial called LL37, which is more potent than any antibiotic, and there's no antibiotic resistance to it. So you have the added benefit of a lower infection rate. What do you think of the future for stem cell treatments in the United States? 
I think, I think it's, I think it's, we're, we're at the best place we've ever been. I've never seen uh, an upward trend like we have right now. Uh, if you'd have told me 10 years ago that in 10 years, Texas was gonna pass a bill that would allow for the, tr the use of adult stem cells, I would have shook my head and said, I, I don't believe you. I said, you know, basically maybe in 20 years. Uh, at the same time, we have, I think a new, you know, the FDA commissioner, has made it very clear, the new, uh, Scott Gottlieb uh, has made it very clear that he wants, he wants to speed things up. Uh, he wants to shut down unscrupulous people. And I think both of those things are very useful. And I think we're gonna see, I think, I think we're gonna see a big uptick in what FDA does. And I don't know how much of that, I, I, I believe, I believe his thoughts were with him before he went into office uh, and before House Bill 810 went through, but I can't help but consider that maybe a state wanting to go their own way um, would put pressure on the federal government to move a little quicker to get these things into the hands of physicians to treat patients. So the future, I, I, I'm absolutely certain that MSCs are going to be uh, Whatever, whatever name they're gonna have in the end uh, are gonna be, uh, go down in history as one of the, the biggest fines uh, uh, for, for treating humans, period. I don't, I don't have a timeline, but, um, but HBH 10 probably push things up a little bit and we don't know what that's gonna look like in the end. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of regulations that still have to be written. We don't know what it's gonna look like, but I think that that pressure of the state, and, and, I, and I truly believe, you know, in the United States of America, and I think we've become basically not that anymore. And um, I'm, I'm very happy that the, the state has taken this position, that they want, to, they want this for their citizens. When I first talked to Representative Parker, I asked him, I said, what, what, why are you doing this, you know? Because I, I, that was the first time I met him. And I had already seen the bill, and we had already been down there to testify. And he said, I'm doing this for the liberty of Texans because I believe it's a liberty, it, it, it's an inherent liberty that you should be able to use whatever tool possible if you have a, if you have a condition. And I don't think the federal government should, I, maybe I'm putting words in his mouth, but I'm paraphrasing what I heard. And you know, that, that our citizens, the citizens of Texas should be able to receive the best therapy possible. And it shouldn't be up to the federal, in my, this is my words, it shouldn't be up to the federal government to decide what that is. Um, you already have plenty of regulations in place. You have, you know, the tech, you have a medical board, a medical licensing board. Um, you have insurance companies that have to insure these doctors. There are a lot of checks and balances already in place. Uh, I think this House Bill 810 really did a great job of, of putting, putting limits on things and, and creating, you know, you have to be responsible. And if you're gonna do this, you have to do it the right way. And, uh, and, I, and I hope the rest of the regulations go well. And if, that, if, if all goes well with this, I think it's not only a big change for Texans, it's, it's a change for US and it's a change globally because once you get physician innovation, you get tools in the hands of, of capable physicians, they're gonna find out new things all the time. So I, I, I brought up Lee's syndrome earlier, which is a mitochondrial disease. And it's, you know, basically these kids are, they, they look normal to develop normal until they're about two, two and a half, and then they just start shriveling up and they stop talking, they stop walking. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times they're, they're dead by the time they're five to eight years old. And so we had, you know, some people that, uh, parents that had, were friends of friends that, and I was always getting pressure and we don't, we don't like to go off protocol in Panama. Uh, and, and there are compassionate use uh, rules there. Uh, ultimately we treated these kids and they just did fantastically well. So that's a case of, um, of innovation that if you were to do that in the US, first of all, who would contemplate? So I spent six hours reviewing the literature to find rash, potential rationale for why the cells would even work. And that was a trick. And then I had to convince a medical advisory committee that 
it's worth a shot because it basically, you know, they came into my office here in South Lake and asked me if we could do it. And I listened to their case, but they brought their kids with them. And then the ultimate shot was, what would you do if it was your kid? And so that's, I, I think that's a rule that I live by. Like, what would it be? What, what would I do if it was my kid, if my mother, me, my brother, my sister? Um, and, and there's a case that in, it, under current regs, federal regs, this would not have been discovered. Right. right. And, and the life, to see the, to see the mother, to, I have a video of when, when one of the children walked again. He was actually in Panama. And to hear the screams of joy in the room uh, make, basically makes it all worthwhile. But we, we can't limit ourselves on this stuff. We have to put it into the hands of responsible people so that we can find out what these tools are. Right. You know. So then who should be regulating it? Is it the FDA or is it a medical board? I believe in the United States of America, and I believe that we are states, and states should regulate things. And, it's, and we, I believe there's federal overreach. I think that FDA has a place, and, they, and, and, and the vast majority of people there want new treatments for people, uh, new, better treatments. I think it's become such a big machine that's very difficult to operate. I've been in bureaucratic, bureaucratic situations. I won't work in academia anymore because it's so political. I mean, we're doing these trials, but you know, you're talking about a couple years of planning just to do something that we would have been done with in Panama already, right? So to get these, to, just to give you an idea, the IND for Ryan Benton cost a half a million dollars in paperwork and in, in consultants and all that. This is to treat a kid Who's, who's gonna die with the stuff that he's been treated for with eight times already outside of the US just to do it in the US to save him and his family the expense and, and the discomfort of getting him on a plane and getting him to Panama. It cost a half a million dollars. Well, how efficient is that? When the treatment, well, he was never charged, but the treatment would never have been over $15,000. Of course, he has to get to Panama and all that sort of thing. But half a million dollars was spent, and almost that amount was spent on the other kid with the six-year-old to do that. So I think the inefficiency of a bureaucracy that's so large is, is really detrimental. And, and if, if we can get a detente with the federal government here in Texas and we can do things responsibly um, under Texas Medical Board, I, I, I think it's it's a much better way to go because then you have, you know, they're requiring an institutional review board from a medical school or from a large hospital. Those people are very responsible. They're not gonna let cowboys come in guns blazing. They're going to make sure the science is sound and the rationale is sound and that the risk benefit ratio is in the favor of the patient, of the subject. Um, and I think, I think states are quite, capable of regulating medical therapy. Um, the, other, the other, I guess the side of the coin is, on, is this inherent safety. If the laboratory that's manufacturing these cells or isolating and growing these cells, which is called manufacturing according to FDA, is doing it responsibly, is doing it under CGMP, which is you know, the, highest, uh, the highest level certification you can get, um, and everything is documented, and there's no risk of transmission of, uh, of infectious disease, and the quality of the cells is there. And I don't know why, I, I don't know why there should be a whole bunch of regulation on that. So Japan has done a, Japan has put a law basically in place. It, it passed in 14. It went into effect November 15. They've already approved three drugs. There's stem cell therapy drugs. Um, and, and I think it's a rational way to go. And it's not the way Texas decided to go, but it's a very rational way to go. Demonstrate safety of your product, and then you can use that product. You can actually market that product for seven years in Japan and determine the efficacy, then come back, and then we'll, we, we'll, we'll give you a conditional approval, right? Because if it's safe, why shouldn't, if you're suffering, if you're a three-year-old, if you're a five-year-old with Lee syndrome, 
why shouldn't you get that medication, right? Particularly if it's already shown to be safe, right? I just can't imagine anybody, there's no logic to support that argument that you would withhold that treatment if, if all, of those, all, the, all the safety pieces are in place. So you had spoken a little bit earlier about how academia has sort of a conflict of interest in this. Can you just describe that a little bit more? Well, I'm not saying all academia does, <laughs> but um, I'll give you some examples without naming names. Um, we, were, we were way down the road with a major university on doing a clinical trial for spinal cord injury a number of years ago. In fact, they had visited us six times. I'd been there five times. Uh, we were really on the, we were, we were screaming down the road of doing a clinical trial together, and all of a sudden it went to zero, and, and I wanted to know why it went to zero. Well, come to find out, they were on clinical hold for a competing product, and that clinical hold came off, and so they dropped us like a hot rock. So that's competition, because they own the, the patents on I'm not, I can't go into too much detail, but they own certain patents on their product, so therefore they, you know, they have a financial conflict of interest if our product worked better or worked at all, it, it might suppress the value of their product. Um, there is a very large institution, not in this country, that is academic, government, um, it's a, it's, a, it's a government, it's not all government, there's some, there's some private in it, it's a very large, very large company, they own intellectual property on a competing type of cell, induced pluripotent stem cell. So the induced pluripotent stem cell is basically, in my mind, is, is cooking, is, is you're going against nature, you're reprogramming adult cells. You're re when you reprogram adult cells, they've already aged, so you don't know what you're gonna get, right? It's not a natural process. So they have all the intellectual property on those cells. So they have, they have publicly, privately, every which way, tried to subvert any, any positive news on adult stem cells. And I get it, right? I understand it. it, it there's no conspiracy theory. It's economics. The same thing with, with pharmaceutical companies. So the, you know, for the anti-rheumatic world, there's, um, there are a number of drugs that, that are biologics that, you know, these people, these people spent a couple billion dollars getting them approved and they're generating about $14 billion a year in revenue. And if, I, if, if I'm a CEO of that company and there's, there's some stem cell dude out there who's that cell can work way better than my drug, way more at a, at a much lower cost, at a much lower frequency, um, I'm gonna probably do everything I can to make sure that that doesn't happen. You know, if I have political, political leverage, I'm gonna use it. If I have, um, you know, uh, ways to do character assassination, I'm gonna use it. So I get it, I understand it, that's an, but that's an economic conflict of interest. Um, there, in academia, you also have research money that's, that's, that's com highly competitive, you know? And so if you're studying a disease state, just pick one that I mentioned. If you're studying disease state and now a treatment comes along that's very effective, then what's gonna to happen to your funding? It's gonna dry up. I mean, I literally have been threatened by academics for, you know, when we published, I'm not even gonna say which condition, we published a paper and I got a threatening phone call, phone call from a, a, the, the leading, the world's leader in this saying that I, I'm not even gonna say what he said, but it was a very threatening phone call uh, about us publishing that and, uh, it, but you know, he's a competitor. So he's in the cell therapy space. He was studying the same thing. Everything he did failed. And in my paper, I basically stated everything he did failed. And look, this worked. It, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't saying it to spear him. I didn't even know him. All I did was laid out the truth. Look, they tried this, this, and this. I didn't even know that he was related to all those things. But so his dollars, you know, are gonna dry up. And so it's, and it, it's, it's mostly economic, but it's, there's a lot of ego there as well. So I, I think that's why you're gonna see, uh, you, you know, in, in, in this process of, of this HB 810, there were a lot of people on the ground all the time, 
uh, and, and I had my finger on the pulse most of the time. And um, I can tell you that the only opposition came from industry and academia. And if you can find evidence to the contrary, please let me know. But I cannot find any evidence to the contrary. Um, wow. And so there, I, and, I, and for the reasons I stated, mostly economic, but partially economic and ego, I think, are the main uh, contributors to that. Where would you like to see stem cell therapies? Where would you like to see it in this country in, let's say, the next five to 10 years? I'd like to see approvals for a number of conditions and, and, and you know the, the first one are, I think everything that I've mentioned deserves deserves a whack um, and I would like to see I would like to see MS patients not have to go to Panama or go to wherever to get treated I would like to see Duchenne's patients get treated here in the US and, and you know SMA patients and Lee syndrome and rheumatoid arthritis and heart failure. Um, I'd like and spinal cord. I'd like to see them all get treated here by their local physician. You know, their local rheumatologist can just administer. Right now, they're administering these other drugs already. IV. It's not. It's not a big jump. You know, but I think I think that's where I'd like to see it in ten years. I I, I can see it in ten years. I can't see it in five years, but I can see I can see it at least for four or five indications in ten in ten years and hopefully more I hope the I hope this this push by Texas really pushes the federal government I hope the federal government really means what they say when they say they, re they really want to get these re these treatments to people responsibly I think there needs to be a different set of rules because of the safety um, the, the the average drug cost in the, in, the, in the past few years to to get Approval has been two and a half billion dollars, billion with a B. Um, that can't be the case here, or we're, we're not going to get there. Um, you know, talking about economic incentives, um, they're, the intellectual property on cells is not strong enough to support somebody spending two and a half billion dollars to get a drug approved for an indication and have somebody come right behind them and and call generic on it and go right behind them. So there has to be a different, there has to be a different set of rules and I don't know who's, who, who can do that, but uh, that, there's a lot of talk about that right now. When it, when it comes to safety, there's, you know, the, we wouldn't exist as a species if these cells were inherently dangerous, donated cells. So when I, when I talk, to, talk to people individually or in a group, I, I'll usually ask how many mothers are in the room. People will raise their hands, and and every every mother who's ever carried a child. Now, you know, keep in mind that when when a baby's made, that there's a mixing 50/50 of mom and dad genetics. So um, the baby is 50% genetically distinct from mom. Well, you have to you have to grow the baby in your womb, deliver the baby, then take care of the baby, and you know get them through high school and all that. And, and you would think that, that mothers would actually have a shorter lifespan than non-mothers, and the exact opposite is true. Mothers live longer than non-mothers by a third of a year per kid, and that goes up to 14 kids. So um, there is an inherent, uh, there's a, and, and we can find stem cells from those babies in moms up to 50 years later. Wow. We can find stem cells. So if there was an inherent danger of, of transplanting MSCs, for example, from one human to another, we would we basically wouldn't exist as a species, in my opinion. So uh, I think the safety issue is pretty covered, and it would be great if we could do if, if there were, the, the, in my mind, an ideal world. We would have legislation like they have in in Japan, where once you demonstrate your product is safe, then you can treat whomever. Any doctor that's licensed to handle that drug can then treat anybody they want and then figure out the efficacy later. And, uh, and that, that would reduce the amount of money spent on approvals by, by tenfold. And that would allow a lot more players. Because you can imagine the, the pool of players is relatively small. 
when it costs two and a half billion dollars to get a drug to market. And then also the risk, the, the risk somebody wants, the financial risk of, of something that's hardly patentable is very high. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, so if you, if you fix those things, then you're gonna, uh, the incentive, I think you incentivize things economically and things will happen a lot quicker. Wow. Thank you so much for coming here and speaking with us today. Well, thank you. This has been absolutely fascinating.